118th Congress addresses a threat that the United States faces from the People's Republic of China, or PRC, sends a powerful signal to the region. I'm grateful for Congress's passing of the FY23 National Defense Authorization Act, including the embedded Taiwan uh, uh, Enhanced Resilience Act, which increases military aid and security cooperation to that embattled island. There are very few bipartisan issues uh, in Washington these days, but our national concern about the PRC is one of them. The U.S. has enduring national interests in the Indo-Pacific, a region at a precarious crossroad where tangible opportunity meets significant challenge. We find ourselves again in peer competition with adversaries who are developing and deploying cutting-edge weaponry and information disorder to undermine our democracy and defeat us. In 2018, I talked about our challenges, a rogue North Korea, a revisionist PRC, and a revanchist Russia. Over the past five years, the situation has worsened, in my opinion, in almost every geo geostrategic measure. A security environment more complex and more volatile and more dangerous than any that I've seen. We are in what I call the decisive decade. Last fall, the current administration finally released its national security strategy. Though I would use the term adversary rather than competitor, the strategy recognizes that the PRC is the only competitor with both the intent and increasingly the capability to reshape the international order. Now, while the U.S. has partnered well with China on several important fronts, Washington and Beijing fundamentally disagree on how to approach the international order. The PRC does not keep its word, from its treaty with the British on Hong Kong to its human rights abuses against the Uyghurs and others, to its attempts at commercial espionage and its quest to intimidate, isolate, and ultimately dominate Taiwan. The PRC's aggression in the South China Sea continues unabated, despite the 2016 Permanent Court of Arbitration's ruling that invalidated China's ridiculous uh, nine-dash line claim and unprecedented land reclamations. Beijing's actions are coordinated, methodical, and strategic, using its military and economic power to erode the free and open international seas. Last week's spy balloon drama playing out on the doorstep of the Secretary of State's planned visit to Beijing typifies PRC bad behavior and disregard for international norms. That Beijing would claim that the incursion over sovereign American airspace uh, was innocuous and unattended beggars the imagination. China's considerable military buildup could soon challenge the U.S. across almost every domain. Now, while some might say the PRC is already there, I'm not one of them yet. However, the PRC is making significant advances in missile systems, including hypersonics, fifth-generation fighters, a Blue Water Navy, and the next wave of technologies, including artificial intelligence and advanced space and cyber. Geopolitically, Beijing seeks to supplant the United States as a security partner of choice for countries not only in the Indo-Pacific, but globally. The U.S. makes it clear that we reject foreign policy based on leverage and dominance. We encourage every country to work in its own interest to protect its own sovereignty. And we must work in our own enlightened self-interest to develop our own reliable sources of rare earths, pharmaceuticals, and chemicals essential for weaponeering, independent of the PRC. Former Deputy National Security Advisor Nadia Shadlow wrote last year that the PRC is, quote, the sole source or primary source supplier for a number of critical energetics materials, unquote. And by energetics, she's referring to those materials that are used for explosives and propellants from bullets to artillery to missiles. We find ourselves sailing into rocks and shoals, to use a nautical analogy. We must invest and innovate uh, to right the errant course that we're on. Otherwise, the Joint Force will struggle to compete with the People's Liberation Army on future battlefields. Now, I note that the current administration's fundamental understanding of the PRC is consistent with its predecessor, as my esteemed colleague knows well. The Secretary of State testified that the previous administration's tougher approach is right, that what's happening in Xinjiang is genocide, and that democracy is being trampled in Hong Kong. The Secretary of Defense testified that he's focused on the threat posed by the PRC, and he promised strong support for Taiwan. Look, Taiwan is democratic, an idea factory, and a global force for good. Just last week, the Cato Institute called Taiwan the freest country in East Asia, ahead of Japan, ahead of South Korea. I've called for ending 
the almost 44-year U.S. policy of strategic ambiguity in favor of strategic clarity. I also believe that we should ink a bilateral free trade agreement with Taipei as soon as possible. The new Indo-Pacific strategy calls for an environment whereby Taiwan's future is determined peacefully by its own people. What a concept. My successor at Indo-Pacific Command testified before Congress in 2021 that the PRC could invade Taiwan in six years. That's 2027. We ignore Admiral Davidson's warning at our peril. The PRC's intent is crystal clear. Maya Angelou once said that when someone shows you who they are, believe them the first time. Well, Xi Jinping has showed us his intent regarding Taiwan time and time again, and shame on us if we ignore him. We must not allow the PRC to dictate America's Taiwan policy. Indeed, I'm worried about the trajectory of the PRC's body politic. Former Australian Prime Minister Kevin Rudd recently wrote that last October's 20th Party Congress, quote, is an era-defining event, cementing Xi Jinping as China's paramount leader, solidifying the country's turn to the state and away from the market, and officially underscoring the primacy of Marxism-Leninism, unquote. In other words, Deng Xiaoping is dead in more ways than one. Mr. Chairman, while challenges to our interests in the Indo-Pacific, especially from the PRC, are real, I believe that America's resolve uh, is powerful and steadfast. I thank you and this committee uh, and the whole Congress for your enduring support to Indo-PACOM, uh, to our armed forces, and our diplomatic corps. 